I decided to take this opportunity uh, to talk about this quantum impurity and the quantum embedding theory because we have seen two talks on this topic yesterday. We'll see more in the coming weeks, but I'm going to talk more from an algorithmic perspective. Some of these materials have been covered in the tutorial week, so that contains more backgrounds and uh, more detailed uh, presentations. So I'm going to talk about two things. One is from the static perspective, uh, which means ground state. Uh, the other is dynamical perspective, means Green's functions. So uh, setup of the quantum antibody problem. So the Hamiltonian contains a non-interacting, aka quadratic, and uh, term and the interacting term, aka a quartic term. So the ground state is given by the minimization of the Hamiltonian minus mu times n. n is the number operator, and uh, you minimize over the entire Fox space. Uh, if you already know the number of electrons a priori, which is you take the expectation with respect to the number operator, you should give you an integer called the number of electrons. Then this number of electrons should be between 0 and L. L is the number of spin orbitals. Uh, so uh, you can uh, then uh, minimize, adjust the Lagrange multiplier called the chemical potential so that the minimizer psi satisfies this constraint. Uh, without loss of the generality, we can always absorb this quadratic n into the t so that uh, this, uh, we can set mu equals 0. Or you can just uh, restrict this to the right any particle sector of the Fox space so that you just uh, do the minimization without this Lagrange multiplier. The simplest setting is called non-interacting system. Means that you don't have the quartic part. All you have is the quadratic Hamiltonian. All, in this case, you can just uh, diagonalize the coefficient matrix T. This can be done very efficiently uh, because of order L cube. I want to say that efficient is relative. It's relative to solving the interacting system. Uh, in workshop three, there will be large-scale DFT calculations and other things. The whole point is to reduce the cost of this order L cube. But since we're talking in this correlated setup, so L cube is considered to be cheap. So we diagonalize this coefficient matrix T. As I said, the chemical potential is without loss of a generality set to zero. Then there are NE eigenvalues that are below the chemical potential, whatever things that are above the chemical potential. You take all the eigenvectors, phi1 to phi L, they form a unitary matrix. Then you can do a basis rotation so that the rotated creation annihilation operators still satisfy the canonical anti commutation relation, CAR. Uh, and uh, so the H0 then become diagonalized in this form. This is uh, epsilon k, the eigenvalues, and this is just like a number operator counting whether the state is occupied or not. Uh, the ground state, in this case, can be just uh, written down uh, as the creation of all the orbitals corresponding to things below the chemical potential then uh, applied to the vacuum. Uh, so this is called a Slater determinant. You don't see a determinant because of the anti symmetrization is hidden under the rock. Uh, but this is truly a determinant, and the ground state energy is just the sum of all the orbital energies. Uh, this is also called a quadratic Hamiltonian single particle picture, or perhaps some other names. Uh, it's not a single particle. You still have any particles, but these particles do not interact with each other except through the Pauli exclusion principle. So the next simplest setup is called quantum impurity, which is an important part of this talk. Uh, here, the H1 uh, has a quadratic form, but I assume that uh, the quartic, uh, quartic form, the quartic interaction, uh, only restricted to the first m indices. Because I don't assume any sparsity pattern of t, I can, without loss of generality, always reshuffle all the indices to the first m indices. And assume that this m is much, much smaller than the global system size, which is called L. Uh, the simplest uh, example is called a single impurity Anderson model, cyan. Uh, means that you have some uh, like uh, uh, quartic thing. There are only f up and f down. You assume there is f electron. So there is a u term here. Everything else is quadratic. 
So you can have f dagger f, f dagger c, c dagger c, that doesn't matter. The only thing that matters is that you only have two spin orbitals, f up and f down, that has a quartic interaction. And uh, uh, these things are related to uh, things like a condo models or things like that. They're very important in physics uh, on their own. But it's also very important as a building block of quantum embedding theory. So can I ask, uh, do, okay, do they call it a quantum impurity model because only uh, electrons around the defect are kind of correlated? Has quartic, right, has a quartic interaction. The rest is quadratic. The quadratic interaction can be arbitrarily complex, but it doesn't matter. Okay. Any other questions? Yeah. Are there any conditions on VK? Are there any conditions on VK? Uh, VK, no. No. Yeah. Uh, no conditions anywhere. Okay. So uh, this is called the impurity model, but still it can have a, a macroscopic number of electrons. So this number of electrons can be OL, and uh, when L goes to infinity, this is, uh, goes to the thermodynamic limit, so the number of electrons can also go to infinity. So this is a paper that, if you just look, the Google Scholar citation is not a lot, but I think it's probably underrated. It's a very good paper uh, by Bravi and Gosset uh, in the Communication Mathematical Physics paper in 2017. It's one of the very, very few rigorous results in this field. And it's a remarkable paper. So it has uh, uh, several theorems. I'm only talking about one of them. Uh, the, 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 they ask the following question. Uh, uh, so I have a quantum impurity model, just a setup as is. OK, you have H0 plus H1. H1 has m terms. Uh, so uh, you want to approximate the ground state energy E, the impurity Hamiltonian, to precision gamma. What is the computational cost? They came up with this computational cost. So it's a, o, it's a uh, multiplicative uh, L cubed term times exponential with OM and with some other stuff. So if I neglect this part, then it looks pretty reasonable because if you have uh, uh, M, uh, like uh, let's say L equal to M, then the cost of solving that would be something like Fu I. And then I have an exponential to the m thing, which seems uh, reasonable. Why it needs to be multiplied by an om cube is less clear. Indeed, that probably can be improved, but uh, uh, the overall spirit seems to be right. Uh, they also, uh, uh, Bravi is a computer scientist, or at least now he's in IBM. And uh, so they care a lot of, from a theoretical computer science perspective, such as so-called inverse polynomial scaling. Uh, and uh, when gamma is one over a polynomial of L, then this thing turns into an exponential of polylog L, and this is called a quasi-polynomial scaling with respect to L. So it's not sharp, but nonetheless, it's, a, uh, it's a remarkable that you can actually show that this is true. Let me talk a bit more on that result. Uh, the, result uh, the paper is uh, uh, kind of technical, so that deserves its own talk. So I'll only talk about some of uh, like uh, some perspectives. Uh, what they uh, roughly do is that they can truncate the eigenvalues of the excitation density matrix, some people call it the quasi-particle density matrix, after a so-called particle hole transformation. So you to truncate those uh, things to get the bath orbitals. Effectively, another way to understand that in the fermionic setup, they formulate that in the so-called Mariana operators and Gaussians, which is a bit alien language to, I guess, most of us. But if you translate that to the, uh, to the fermionic language, what they're roughly saying is something that many people in the audience do know, which is the assumption is that the psi, the many body wave function, can be approximately factorized into two parts. One is the impurity Hamiltonian, which is very complex, and the other is a core, and the core is non-interacting. Uh, so the claim, uh, uh, my claim here, is that their so-called quasi-polynomial scaling has important details on the rock, and that's a, uh, it is, uh, instead of talking about the quasi-polynomial scaling, it is actually important to count the number of bath orbitals you use to prove this theorem. Their proof is based on some so-called a priori bath construction. I guess this is another new idea to most of the people in the audience, in the sense that they actually only use the information of H0 and do some massage. 
and uh, they can figure out that most of the orbitals that are decoupled from the impurity. And uh, this is done a priori. That's very important. That's why they can actually prove something about it. So, but this pays a heavy price. The number of bath orbitals is m, that should be there, divided by gamma. Gamma is the precision. It means that if you want to get 10 times more accurate, you need 10 times more, more bath orbitals. I guess immediately people familiar with the quantum chemistry literature think this is ridiculous. So, uh, but, but this is what you can prove. Yeah, uh, oh. So when you say truncation, is this a synonym for Bath and impurity or it is not? It is very much related to that. And uh, the bath, uh, roughly speaking, is when you look at the quasi-particle density matrix, and uh, you, there it exists a certain decomposition, but you don't know where to truncate. And uh, what they do is you start from the quadratic Hamiltonian and explicitly show that a certain part must be decoupled from the impurity. And the thing that are not decoupled is called a bath. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, M was the number of bath variables. Uh, M is the number of uh, like impurity orbitals. So, yeah. so like H one says, says the first M things they arbitrarily interact with each other with a quartic interaction. The rest is quadratic. So M is the that thing that cannot be reduced. But this M over gamma is highly suspicious. Yeah. Dominica. What do you mean by accuracy here? That, like, you know, accuracy means you want to approximate the energy E to additive accuracy gamma. Means that you want to produce a number that is close to the ground state energy E, t e produce a number called E tilde, E tilde minus E is less than gamma. Uh, absolute value. So why is M not an energy? This is what I wonder about. M is not an energy. Yeah, because it's, uh, it, it, I mean, um, unit wise, uh, it should be an energy, is it? Uh, M is this. Yes, but uh, V carries the unit of energy. Yes, M is just a number. M over gamma it should be a dimensionless quantity. Oh yeah, the the, the uh, there is a non-dimensionalization going on about the h zero. Yeah, yeah, you're right. Yeah, so of course there is a you need to bound the energy somewhere. Yeah. Any other questions? Okay, so open problem. Uh, as far as I know, which is uh, whether this, uh, uh, for this impurity problem, the number of bath orbitals can be provably reduced with respect to gamma. I have some reason to uh, believe that this is, if you do it a priori, this is sharp, but I don't have a good uh, uh, proof. But if you want to have questions and uh, uh, discussions, I'll be very happy to talk about that. But from a practice, <clears throat> I would say that the number of bath orbitals should be expected to be m log m over gamma, which means that if you want to have uh, improved the accuracy by a factor of 10, it should only contribute a logarithmic factor. Uh, so there is a big difference, potential big difference, between the a priori bath construction and the numerical, numerically optimized uh, bath construction. What is quantum embedding, roughly speaking, is that you have a bit, let's say, Hubbard model. It's not an impurity problem. You artificially chop it into impurity problems. So this is like a two, four sides that are interacting with each other. Uh, uh, field dust means that it's uh, like uh, 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 there is a quartic interaction, but I chop that into a few subsystems for which each of them only has like a, quadrat a quartic interaction here and the rest is quadratic. Uh, the assumption is that you cannot solve the entire correlated problem. That's just you cannot do. Uh, you're willing to solve a series of problems. Uh, we each of size are impurity problems with an impurity of size m, which is much smaller than l, with cost up to exponential o m. O t alpha means up to a logarithmic fa polylogarithmic factor. So um, uh, this procedure is often more of a recipe than a rigorous theory, except in some extreme regimes, such as non-interacting systems, dimension go to infinity, so on, so on and so forth. So your, your uh, purple dots, they're, they're, they composed of many, of a part of a system. It's not like a single. It could be a single dot, could be a part of a system. I'm just, a, this is a cartoon. 
Just, yeah, just, yeah, just the yeah, 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 yeah. So this is the spirit of the decomposition. Yeah. So uh, according to discussion with Julia yesterday, uh, it is important to distinguish two classes of embedding methods. One is there is some feedback between the fragment and the environment. The other is environment feeds one di uh, unidirectionally to the fragment. So some examples of static quantum embedding theory. Static, again, means that we're interested in equilibrium or interested in the ground state. Yeah, sorry, just one quick question. Can the fragment overlap or not? Uh, I, uh, good question. Throughout the entire talk, fragments do not overlap. Once they overlap, all sorts of issues would arise. OK, so um, uh, without the feedbacks between the fragment and the environment, other than through some orbital orthogonalization, then some of the old methods in quantum chemistry, they can really be viewed as quantum embedding, uh, I think, bona fide uh, quantum embedding methods, uh, such as the CASSF, CASPD2, RAS version. I mean, those are the impurity solvers. I think those are reasonable. If you look at that, they really look like impurity solvers. Um, so projection-based embedding theory, as uh, developed by uh, Fred Manby and Tom Miller and collaborators in 2012 is another version of this sort. Uh, so we give a, like a simpler linear algebraic interpretation of a simplified version with uh, uh, Leonardo Cepeda uh, th three years ago. Unfortunately, due to health uh, reasons and uh, um, uh, like he couldn't come. Uh, uh, otherwise, yeah, he was uh, supposed to give a talk today. Uh, so uh, uh, with uh, feedbacks between the fragment and the environment, uh, one is uh, uh, density matrix embedding theory, DMET, as uh, developed by uh, Garner Chen and collaborators. There have been many subsequent improvements by Booth, Gagliardi, Scuseria, Van Buris, and other people. Um, you heard from uh, Michael Lindsay talking about uh, variational embedding theory, and uh, that's another way of uh, so things with the feedback in terms of the one RDM and two RDM. So the spirit of all this is to partition, of, uh, do the partition of the orbital space. After proper rotation, you uh, distinguish all the orbitals into so-called fragment, bath, core, and virtual orbitals. Uh, so the idea is that the fragment and the bath form an impurity called active space. Then there are two inactive ones for different reasons. One is the core that it has to be doubly occupied. The other is the virtual that is not occupied. And then inside of this, you can do crazy things. So that's the idea of the partition of uh, CASSF, but also other impurity solvers and the embedding theories as well. Uh, so here is a concise derivation of DMET uh, for a more algorithmic uh, or mathematical audience. So uh, it is based on the so-called bath construction uh, from uh, non-interacting systems. And the setup is that you look at the one RDM, the single particle uh, reduced density matrix, equals to phi phi star. And this phi is of size L by NE, is a tall skinny matrix. And uh, it's also, uh, that satisfies normalization condition. You partition this phi into uh, two parts. LA is like M. LA is literally M. So it's a very small number, but NE can be large. OK, so this is the partition of the matrix. So let me remind you. So this can be large, LA equal to M. This is very tiny, and the whole thing is L, which is huge. So this is the idea. So you apply something called a CS decomposition, or the cosine sine decomposition, to this file. Then, very naturally, you just uh, 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 go through this decomposition, uh, it will partition all the orbitals automatically into four categories. One is the, uh, the cosine, it is called the cosine sine decomposition because in the middle, this, there's a, this a sigma A and a sigma B satisfies, these are diagonal matrices uh, satisfying sigma A square plus sigma B square is the identity, which literally means that one can be interpreted as a cosine, the other interpreted as a sine. And uh, then there is uh, some identity here that corresponds to the core. There is a zero here that corresponds to a virtual, which means it doesn't contribute to anything. Then there is a fragment, which is uh, the thing you care about at the beginning, which is coupled with the bath. And then there is a unitary matrix followed there. The reason why you want to do this is because you can then define the four sets of orbitals. Fragment 
you can use any basis, let's say use identity. Bath is the bath, and then you have a core and virtual. The virtual won't be used in the DMET. So you do a rotation of the 1RDM, you will find that the 1RDM takes a so-called decoupled form. That means the first m orbitals, they are indeed coupled to the bath orbitals. However, they're all decoupled from the core orbitals, and there is just identity. Because of this decoupling, you can actually do a rotation and only restrict it to the first fragment plus path, which is much, much smaller than the total number of orbitals you have. In fact, it will be independent from L, that is the global system size. So uh, in physics terminology, uh, only the, uh, the, uh, 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 the bath orbitals are entangled to the fragments. And you can also count the number of electrons in the impurity. That's a, one of the most interesting observations in DMET. That is, uh, the number of uh, uh, core orbitals uh, is exactly Ne minus La, which means that the total number of electrons in the impurity must be Ne minus that number, which is La. But by the way, uh, how many orbitals are there in, in the impurity? It's a L, two La. So impurity is in general at half fitting which is an uh, 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 interesting observation. And that, yeah. Are A and B flipped in that? Uh, Sorry? Are A and B flipped in that equation? Any B flipped in that equation? Because there's a UA but no UB. Oh, maybe there should be a UB I missed. Maybe, yeah. Okay. Yeah, maybe there should be a UB star UB, I think. Oh, uh, no, maybe yeah, UB, UB star or something. UA sigma. Uh, uh, yeah, okay. Yeah, th there's probably a typo there. Yeah. Why the number of electrons is LA? Sorry? Why the number of electrons is. Why, why the impurities have field? Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So this is actually not so intuitive. Let me explain it again. So through the CS decomposition, you will figure out that the number of uh, co orbitals um, cannot be larger than, uh, but. Uh, Let's just assume it is this number. It is always Ne minus LA. There is another interpretation of this, res this result from Cauchy interlacing theorem, but uh, that uh, gives you the same result. So it's like uh, uh, because of the number of core orbitals is Ne minus LA, then the number of electrons in the impurity, which is deep coupled from the core, must be the total number of electrons minus that, which is LA. And uh, this size is 2LA, so half fitting. Okay, so then once you define the so-called uh, uh, this set of four orbitals, you can rotate Lx equals to 2La, and you can rotate, get this, uh, 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 it looks complicated, uh, but they're actually, uh, the principle is actually simple. You're just rotating the orbital of the Ts and the Vs, and here you need to remove the so-called double counting term we have heard in the past yesterday, and uh, due to the Hartree fog, and from the core orbitals, and that's it. So uh, then you, uh, th this we are only solving this for one impurity, and uh, uh, for this single impurity you you get the one RDM, and you just take the fragment part, and you go through this entire procedure for all the fragments, and you will end up with. Uh, block diagonal information of the 1RDM. It doesn't mean that the 1RDM itself is, is like a block diagonal. You only get access to the information of the block diagonals of a, like this 1RDM. But what can you do with it? I mean, there is no feedback yet. So the feedback is done through the so-called matching condition. Uh, because I said you get this decomposition of the orbitals, through uh, a so-called, um, uh, like this a CS decomposition. But where do you get access to this uh, low-level uh, one, uh, low-level density matrix D, or the corresponding uh, singular vectors phi? So this one is done by uh, 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 following the two principles. Uh, the two principles do not uniquely define the procedure. So, 
Uh, one is that this uh, low-level density matrix D should minimize a certain energy functional, and two is that it should uh, match, uh, the diagonal blocks should match with those from the high-level calculation. So uh, the, whenever a word matching uh, appears, uh, it automatically means that there is a Lagrange multiplier, and the Lagrange multiplier in the case of the DMET is called a correlation potential. So the correlation potential also has this block diagonal form, because all you want to match are blocks on the like block diagonal things. Uh, so you diagonal this T plus this uh, correlation potential uh, that gives you a density matrix. Uh, in other words, you can define this uh, uh, operation calligraphy D. Take a T plus U with a number of electrons, you get the D. And this T can be replaced by any fixed Fock matrix that give rise to a, a variety of techniques called part self-consistency, blah, blah. There are many other things to define the so-called D. Uh, it is important to talk about the domain. It is even more important to talk about the domain in later when we talk about Green's functions. But uh, for the static thing, it is also to, uh, 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 this is the important thing, that uh, you look, uh, there's this uh, block structure which are all the matrices that are uh, given by some uh, like a block diagonal of small matrices. Uh, each of them is a Hermitian. The domain of the correlation potential due to a gauge degree of freedom, you can add a constant, doesn't change anything. So that's restricted to all the matrices of a block diagonal form, but uh, it's traceless. Uh, and the domain of the high level density matrix blocks these are given by uh, also these blocks, but satisfying the trace normalization condition, and each of the subblocks should be, the eigenvalues should be bounded between zero and one. So uh, the original method uh, in DMET to, uh, like proposed to do this, uh, 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 fulfill this matching condition is called the least square procedure, LSDMET. So the least square fitting roughly says that Okay, I get the low-level density matrix. I take the fragment apart for each impurity, and I just try to match the input data from the high-level density matrix in the domain. And I choose the correlation potential so that it gets error that is as small as possible. This is a very nonlinear optimization procedure. Uh, you get stuck at a local minimizer often. Uh, so uh, often you cannot reach the... Uh, uh, minimum, uh, this is not zero, so this is called inexact matching. It was immediately realized by Scusari and collaborators after the uh, original developments of DMET, and they proposed uh, some ways to partial fix of the procedure. Um, this thing also creates another problem called a gapless problem, means that if there's no gap between the NE and NE plus one's eigenvalues, of this T plus U matrix, because the U is totally artificial. You, you really have no physical control of this behavior of T plus U. If there's a gap list, then the whole thing just <coughs> recede. Um, and all these three things seems to be relatively independent issues. And uh, inexact uh, local minimization, and the inexact matching, and the gap list. Seem three are all well knowledged. Uh, 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 like acknowledged problem, but uh, this seems to be relatively independent. So let me show you that the issues do exist. And uh, uh, by the way, you might think that in DMET or all these embedding calculations, the uh, mean field part, uh, the mean field part, or the low-level things should be cheap, and the high-level things should be more expensive. Asymptotically, yes. But what I'm showing here is that the low-level calculation of the DMET for a system that is not too large, this is like a 128 uh, uh, size Harvard model, can exceed 20,000 seconds, which is even larger than the impurity solution. And it says that the low-level solver actually is important. And the other is the success rate. This is a 6 by 6 Harvard model, very small, with uh, 1,000 samples, uh, like with a random on-site potential. And you can see that in this phase diagram, this is fitting, this is the U interaction. Many parts of this phase diagram, the success rate of the LSDMET is close to 0%. <laughs> and sometimes it succeeds, but many times it just says it cannot converge. Now, in some other places, it works. Yeah, can I, they, this least squares matching, does it have an, an analog in, like, in just in PDE? Uh, like, is this? 
we can talk about that later. Uh, yeah, not, yeah. Not, not immediately clear to me. Okay, yeah. So we thought about like, uh, 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 like uh, making this problem a little bit more well behaved. Uh, yeah. So we look at this energy functional, and which is just a, you take the t plus u and look at all the lowest uh, any eigenvalues, and you add them up together, and this is like, uh, uh, you can equivalently write this as the, the trace of the matrix times this density matrix. So when this T plus U is gapped, uh, then you can do some sort of a Hyman Feynman type of calculation, showing that the gradient of the, uh, with respect to the correlation potential of uh, this F, or the energy functional, gives you exactly the diagonal block of the low-level density matrix. Uh, then you can also do some simple calculations so show that this is also a concave functional because uh, they are eigen solving an eigenmatic problem. Uh, then you can uh, try to do a so-called concave conjugate, or mathematically called the legendre frenzo transform. Uh, so given the input data, which is the, like, uh, the high-level density matrix, and you try to, uh, the Legendre dual to the Fu is given by this formulation and it gives you a minimization problem. And this is a convex optimization problem. Can be robustly solved with mature software such as CVX. In fact, the code just looks like that, or at least the spirit of the code, which is to solve that matching condition problem. The input is P, you have the correlation potential, uh, to, they are symmetric. And uh, you minimize that uh, u, trace p times u, minus lambda sum smallest t plus u and e. And uh, the mask imposes the diagonal condition. That's it. This is the code. And you can run it. And uh, this is what you get. Uh, let's recall that for the LSDMET, previously there are certain places, a lot of places, the success rate is like a 0%. And here, now you see that most of the places in the phase diagram, the success rate is about 100%. Even here, the dark blue here means the success rate is about 90%. So that is like, uh, you can actually make a big difference uh, and in terms of changing the method for doing the optimization. So that solves like the first problem. What's going on when it phased? What's going on? It, it usually is a gap is. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So the... Uh, this is the first problem. So I said there are three problems. There is a, like a guest duck at the local minima. You can reformulate this thing from a non-linear optimization, non-convex optimization problem to a convex optimization, very fortunately. But also we have other two issues, which are the so-called gapless and inexact matching. So it turns out that you can prove the following theorem, uh, which basically says that thanks to the convex optimization perspective, you can know that uh, so this F star, it indeed op uh, admits optimizer U star under some uh, mild conditions. And then this high level density matrix lies in the so-called super gradient set of F at this U star. Then if F plus U star is gapped, you can provably achieve exact matching. Which means that when inexact matching occurs, it means it is also gapless. So the people observed this kind of thing before, but there was an obvious connection between these two problems, but actually what you can show is that these two problems are the same problem. So, um, uh, yeah, some uh, technical remarks that uh, uh, this thing, uh, this condition here, ensures that P is in the so-called relative interior of the domain, which is important to establish the existence of the supergradient. And also, the condition for U star to be unique is an open question. We don't know how to solve uh, this issue. So what do you do with the gapless problems? Uh, so it actually arises more frequently than you like, such as uh, in the doped Hubbard model. And one observation is that both the LS and the CVX version assumes the so-called off ball principle. And uh, so you uh, need to uh, consider, uh, you can consider a modified optimization problem. You minimize some energies and uh, assume some matching condition, but without enforcing the off ball principle. Uh, then you can ask the question whether the minimizer admits uh, uh, like uh, U that still satisfies this thing? The answer is maybe no. And this has important implications in terms of finding exact exchange correlation potential in the discrete setting. 
it's a very well acknowledged in the uh, DFT literature that the uh, V representability it seems not to be an issue in the continuous setting, but in the lattice case, there are like uh, various things that may go wrong, and we give explicit examples that this might go wrong even in the block setup. Uh, so, but uh, whether exact matching can be achieved? The answer is actually yes. I, I think uh, Fabian uh, is going to talk about uh, is going to talk about that on Thursday. Uh, and uh, uh, question. Hello, can you hear me? Yeah. Hi, John. Yeah, brilliant. Yeah. Hi, Lynn. Um, I just wanted to ask a quick question. You make the point that this this correlation potential yeah. is completely artificial and that it's just representing some kind of auxiliary system. Yeah. Now, you've already made a, a, a comparison to DFT and some of this, and lots of people use that auxiliary system of DFT to try and get insights into the actual physics yeah. of the system. Yeah. Is that at all ever a reasonable thing to do? Uh, you know, looking at things like gaps of this auxiliary system, I appreciate that there is perhaps very little you can say with with any definitive statements about it, but but we expect it to be somewhat representative of the physics that you're capturing, right? Excellent question. So the question is whether that correlation potential can indeed be interpreted as some sort of exchange correlation potential uh, um, in DFT. The answer is probably yes if you're restricted to the uh, like the uh, diagonal interpretation. But in the block diagonal case, things are indeed much more complicated and it's much less clear what you can do and how to come up with an energy functional whose uh, a derivative gives you the correlation potential. Does that answer your question? Okay, seems to be. Yeah, so, so given I'm running out of time, I won't talk about the implication of uh, this uh, thing. Uh, let me quickly talk about the dynamical perspective. So, uh, so we switch gears a little bit, and because we talk about Green's functions, uh, so I won't go through this uh, complex formulation, just to say that it's the mapping from a complex number called a frequency to a matrix. So even though this is a, like a many-body system. So the simplest setting is the non-interacting. And again, you only have a quadratic Hamiltonian. You can diagonalize it. But then you can compute that complicated thing is just a, a matrix inverse. So z minus t inverse. That is the whole thing about this so-called time-ordered Green's function. So with interaction, things are a lot more complicated. So you can compute this gz from the previous like, uh, uh, slide which is rather complicated in many-body calculation, and you look at the invert difference, differences between the inverse of a G and the inverse of a G naught, and this is called a self-energy. So the next simplest setting, obviously, should be quantum impurity. So the basic structure of quantum impurity is called a sparsity pattern. So this is based on the following observation. You uh, can compute the G naught for a non-interacting system, the impurity is a local perturbation. However, the perturbation to the Green's function is very global. So here what I'm showing is a single site impurity model. I add, like before and after adding the impurity, I look at the differences between the Green's functions and just the difference everywhere. However, if you look at the difference of the, uh, the inverse of the Green's function, which is called the self-energy, it is completely sparse. And this is the foundation of dynamical mean field theory, continuous time quantum Monte Carlo, so on and so forth. It, as far as we know, it's like a folk theorem, uh, like uh, at least since Feynman. Uh, you can easily come up with a diagrammatic argument showing, like, showing why this is true. For whatever reason, we couldn't find a non perturbative proof, and the one was given in 2020. But uh, I think it's uh, rather just a belated, rigorous. Uh, Statement, but we did say uh, much more than just uh, this setup. This structure actually holds uh, much more generally when you look at the sparsity pattern of the self energy. So, some examples of a uh, quantum embedding theory uh, you can, again, just like CASSF, can be viewed as an impurity solver for the ground state. The continuous time QMC and other some, some other flavors of QMC can be viewed as an impurity solver for the Green's functions. Uh, Constraint, this may be a little bit provocative. I think the constraint RPA embedding we heard yesterday 
and can be sort of be thought as a, a, a embedding in this setup, uh, but the contribution from the environment is way more complicated than that of the CTQMC, which is only contributing through some sort of hybridization. Is that fair? Okay, yeah. yeah. So uh, with feedbacks, uh, then there's a, like a dynamical mean field theory, uh, SEET, and uh, many other improvements and many more theories, and uh, this is uh, like summarized by Garner Chan's paper, uh, is a little bit old, like six years from now. Idea of DMFT. Uh, so uh, we assume non-overlapping partition, and uh, there's some block diagonal approximation to the self-energy, okay? Uh, the low-level density matrix is obtained. Once you have this block diagonal thing, you can invert this large matrix, and then, a little bit confusingly, you extract the, like the diagonal blocks of these green functions, just like you're extracting the diagonal blocks of the high-level 1RDM. The so-called hybridization, which sometimes is uh, used uh, like more generally in the field, but to me, it should refer to this thing specifically, that is the difference between the G inverse uh, and the Z minus H naught minus the self-energy. That's it. So this is the definition of hybridization. Then this DMFT SCF loop just roughly goes like the following. You start from uh, H with the hybridization, defines an open quantum system, gives you a, like a, uh, some Green's function, uh, this high level, and then this allows you to evaluate the self-energy through the Dyson equation. You construct this uh, like uh, uh, the uh, uh, the self energy uh, diagonal blocks. You compute the low level uh, Green's function. You compute the hybridization, and then go through the loop. And uh, the so called matching condition is done uh, through this thing, which is very much similar to the DMET, but uh, for the uh, for the Green's function now. So uh, again, there is a robustness issue. Uh, you might think like uh, this hybridization fitting is easy, but it isn't. Uh, and I, uh, so we made some contributions to like uh, improve the robustness. Uh, this gives you some idea. Uh, this thing can easily run a day for a day, and the success rate can be I don't know like one percent, five percent, or something because it's uh, through like uh, 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 like uh, uh, unconstrained. Uh, 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 sorry. Uh, a gradient-free optimization procedure. We developed a, like a so-called semi-definite relaxation method that uh, really increased the robustness. But again, it could fail. And uh, this is something we're still working on. Uh, let me use the final few minutes to talk about this Lattinger Ward functional, uh, which is uh, widely viewed as the foundation to the DMFT, but also many other Green's function functional theories. Uh, so we heard this from Dominica's tutorial talk. Let's uh, just recall that it has this uh, complicated formula, which is you have some free energy, uh, 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 and this can be written as some uh, terms that even have some uh, singularities, but there is, is this phi called the Latin reward functional. DMFT can be very concisely written as ansatz for the Latin reward functional, which means that you assume this phi can be written somehow as the summation of universal functionals on G acting only on the impurity, and then the sigma is written as the gradient of phi with respect to the G. Of course, the question is what is the domain of this thing, and what does it even mean to have such a functional? Uh, so this, uh, the Latin reward was a uh, uh, thing, was proposed by uh, in the 60s, and people widely take that like uh, as uh, for granted, even though originally it was non uh, it was a perturbatively constructed, but uh, over the years uh, it became more and more generally used until maybe in 2015, uh, Kozik, Farrow, and Georges they wrote this paper with the title "Non-Existence of the Latin Reward Functional." You might think like this is a paper written by mathematicians, but they are physicists, and uh, uh, the like. Yeah, so so. so uh, uh, it's a very interesting phenomena, and uh, so this is, uh, 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 they say that the sigma g may not be singular valued, and whether you, this is truly shows the non-existence uh, of the Latin reward function after seven years, I believe it is still controversial, and some very partial progress we made that, like, uh, 
uh, a paper a few years ago and also a much longer paper that uh, Michael introduced during the tutorial talk and published last year. So the domain of the Green's functions, the, uh, here are some guesses. Fact one is that the G lies in the following set. This is very much related to the so-called causality, uh, which means that for time order the Green's functions, the imaginary time the imaginary part of the Green's function should be should be uh, uh, non uh, non negative. So uh, so this means that the Green's function takes this particular form, which is x k is a positive semi definite matrix. This epsilon k are real, and then there is also this uh, thing called the sum root here, which is important for the uh, for some other constructions. Factor two is a pretty interesting one. And that shows the relation between the Green's function and the inverse of it. And as you have seen in the DMFT, the inverse is actually a very, very important thing. And what you can show through algebraic manipulation is that whenever you have a G that this form, uh, that uh, is a, a generalized I think, called the Navalina function, or matrix version of the Navalina function, the G inverse takes the form of a, a Z minus a static part minus a Navalina term. So this is very, very important because it says that if G takes this form, then the hybridization must take that form. Okay? And similarly, you can prove the other way, which is if hybridization takes that form, G must take that form. So this forms like a closed loop. Uh, so this type of structures it has inspired and is inspiring new hybridization fitting, and also analytic continuation type of methods. Uh, Dominica and uh, Emmanuel Go and uh, they made uh, uh, contributions along these lines like uh, last year. Uh, I think this was earlier PIL paper. This is on archive. Lexing Ng developed uh, earlier, like two months ago, some uh, other int very interesting observations uh, using Prunis method. Uh, so we're extending the SDR methods uh, for this new setup as well. Uh, this is some ongoing collaboration with my student, uh, Zhen Huang, Avi Jixi, and also Dominica. So let me end this talk with uh, uh, the thing that already showed up in the tutorial week, which is Michael Lindsay made the following conjecture on the domain of the Latin reward functional. There are two parts. The first is that uh, for fixed interaction, there is a one-to-one -one correspondence between the frequency-dependent single particle Hamiltonians, which is in that set, and the physical Green's function G in this set, D. That's the first part. The second part is that the Latin reward functional, phi G, can be constructed on this domain such that the euro expected thing hold, but for all corresponding A and G. I think on the spot, he offered the cash prize of $50 to anyone who can prove uh, like uh, the conjecture or coming up with a counterexample. I think this is recorded. You can find that in the recording. Uh, so yeah, unfortunately, yeah, as he explained, he uh, caught COVID and couldn't come. And uh, I, otherwise, I think it would be more fun. Uh, so uh, uh, so, uh, uh, so uh, the, this really shows that the Green's function functional is fundamentally about open quantum systems. As much as we want to restrict all the discussions to closed quantum systems, this is really about uh, open quantum systems because of this frequency dependent single particle Hamiltonian. And uh, for many of the details, you can see his uh, PhD thesis and also the tutorial talk on Wednesday. Let me conclude. So I think the quantum embedding theory is a reasonable, scalable version uh, algorithm for uh, strongly correlated uh, uh, electron structure calculations uh, that is um, on a large scale, maybe before breakthroughs in machine learning, quantum computing, tensor networks, and so on and so forth. Uh, so it involves a lot of recipes, also got artistic components. Uh, so you can come up with your own recipe, and maybe it will just perform better. It's a, many of the decisions are not so well justified. It's just a, out of necessity, rather than saying that uh, this must be like that. Uh, but the matching condition, it really deserves some careful mathematical scrutiny, and I think there's a lot of room for algorithmic improvement, which may even impact practical quantum embedding calculations. I'd like to thank current and former group members, including Fabian, uh, sitting in the audience, 
Ray, uh, who's a grad student, uh, Michael, um, uh, he's currently at Quran, still deciding where he's going to go next. Yutong is going to be an IQIM fellow at Caltech. Xiaojie Wu, who developed a lot of this DMET thing. Uh, by then, interestingly, their science department uh, recently decided to work on DMET and hired him to lead this uh, effort. Uh, and also, Leonardo, unfortunately, he couldn't come, uh, and he's currently at UW Medicine, as well as uh, other collaborators. Uh, uh, and uh, finally, thank you for your attention. <laughs>